Health in space isn't just about fitness. Imagine being far from Earth and suddenly you get appendicitis, or a broken bone, or a severe infection. What then? On the ISS, astronauts can be evacuated back to Earth within hours. However, if we want to venture beyond this, a return trip could take months or years. Evacuation is impossible. This means astronauts having to become their own doctors. This is just one of many problems that's currently being looked at in the build-up to sending the first humans to Mars. In our last video, we looked at the impact space has on a human body. While we can mitigate these issues long enough to send people to the International Space Station for periods of about six months, a three-year trip to Mars is a completely different ballgame. A trip to Mars requires development of everything from growing nutrient-rich food in space to healthcare and advanced shielding from radiation. They have to train on so many things, on the vehicle, on every system, on the spacecraft, on their spacesuits, what they're going to do when they get to Mars, right? And so the medical piece of it is actually a very small part of their training. Dr. Dorit Donneville, PhD, is the executive director for the Translation Research Institute for Space Health. And they may get the medical training six months before they leave, and now they have to implement what they learned six months ago. The thing that worries us the most are the unknown unknowns, right, which can happen. They may have a new syndrome that we've never seen before in space. Nobody's ever gone to Mars. Nobody's ever experienced the chronic uh, bombardment of the galactic cosmic rays for a long period of time. Just don't know what's going to happen. NASA is testing telemedicine systems. Kits will include advanced medical gear, 3D printed tools, and maybe even small surgical robots. There's research into using AI to guide medical procedures. Basically, a digital doctor in the spacecraft. I'll be honest with you. Um, we are really reluctant to do surgery in space because the stabilization and the infrastructure that you would need to do it safely is really just such a last resort. It's all about trades, right? So if you're going to take a surgical robot and everything that you would need to actually implement a surgical procedure for something that has a really small probability of occurring, you have to make that trade. Are you going to take that? versus more food or medications or more water or more shielding for radiation. So those are the kinds of trades that we're going to do. Even for appendicitis today, many doctors will tell you they'll just give you antibiotics and watch. So they may not hurry to surgical, they may try to stabilize with antibiotics and pain management. When you're floating hundreds of millions of kilometers from home, inside a cramped spacecraft the size of a small apartment, with the same crew day after day. Loneliness and stress can hit harder than radiation. NASA calls this the Behavioral Health Challenge, and it is a major concern for sending people to Mars. The International Space Station sits about 250 miles 400 kilometers above Earth, which can take as little as six hours to get to, with a typical stay being around the six-month mark. The Moon is on average 238,855 miles or 384,400 kilometers away from Earth. The last mission to the Moon on Apollo 17 still took only three days and 10 hours to get there. And that was with the technology available in 1972. Mars, on the other hand, is 140 million miles or 225 million kilometers from Earth. That's 58.6 times the distance to the Moon. It would take roughly seven to nine months to get to Mars with current technologies, and missions are expected to last about three years. Astronauts will have to deal with confinement, sensory monotony, disrupted sleep cycles, and the psychological weight of being so far from Earth. Imagine waking up every morning and knowing that if something goes wrong, help is not hours away, but months. Dr. Michael R. Barrett is an astronaut physician with three space trips and 447 total days spent in space. We would really like to send people who are experienced in long duration flight to begin with, even though you're close to home, you've taken a big step by spending several months at a time off the planet in a confined environment with, with crewmates and having to figure out what team dynamic works in a critical scenario. And, you know, even a, a normal day on station, you're still a hair's breadth away from 
any number of disasters that can happen to you. And then you add the separation aspect of it. So no real-time communication, no real return options. If you're on your way outbound to Mars, you can't turn around and come back. So you don't have an abort option. So that will be a stress. Uh, there will be a disconnection that we really haven't seen before. In one simulated Mars mission on Earth, known as Mars 500, six volunteers were locked inside a mock spacecraft in Moscow for 520 days. The goal? To study the psychological strain of isolation. The results, sleep problems, mood swings, even breakdowns in crew communication. And that was without the real dangers of space. So, what's the solution? Astronauts will need more than just good spirits. They'll rely on carefully designed routines, regular communication with family back on Earth, and psychological support systems built into the mission. Some experts even suggest using virtual reality environments, letting astronauts walk through forests or beaches in VR to fight off cabin fever. Music, books, art and creative outlets will also play a huge role. We're revolutionizing space. We're doing things differently. Investing in our ideas and innovations to prove and deploy new capabilities faster than ever. Advancing space exploration with new business models and proven technology. Powering a lunar economy and deep space travel. We're shaping the future to make history again. If you ask most of us what we miss most when we're in space, it's, it's family. You balancing that homesickness against the the panache of discovery, the the, the lure of, of exploration, which is why you signed on in the first place. It's it's not like it's not counterweighted by something really really heavy. You're watching Earth recede. It goes from this beautiful blue orb to a you know just this pale blue dot we're all familiar with. At the same time, that pale red dot is getting bigger and the anticipation of arriving to this new amazing novel place and you know being among the first to be there and all the questions we have is there water where is it what's the ice like can we use it is there life will we see layers of fungal elements or lichens or something i mean all that stuff is is a huge magnet that's going to counterweight all the negative psychological effects in deep space sanity is as important as oxygen but while isolation attacks the mind, the cosmos itself attacks the body with something far more dangerous and invisible, cosmic radiation. Radiation in space is not like the background radiation we experience on Earth. Here, our atmosphere and magnetic field protect us from the most harmful rays. But in deep space, astronauts are exposed to galactic cosmic rays and solar particle events, basically high energy bullets flying through your body. One astronaut described it as seeing flashes of light when they close their eyes. That's radiation zipping through their retinas. Radiation can damage DNA, increase cancer risk, and even affect cognitive function. Long-term exposure could raise the chances of heart disease and neurological issues. A round trip to Mars? Astronauts could absorb a radiation dose equivalent to thousands of chest X-rays. The longer you're exposed to radiation, the more you're accumulating damage to your tissues and your DNA. And with cancer, for example, it's additive, right? So you may have one mutation, that, that will still be okay, your body's able to repair it. But once you, you accumulate more and more mutations, you create these problems. So how do we shield against something so powerful? Engineers are testing a variety of strategies. Thicker spacecraft walls lined with hydrogen-rich materials, Water tanks are strategically placed around crew quarters because water is effective at absorbing radiation. Even the possibility of using magnetic shields, basically mini magnetic fields around spacecrafts, like Earth's natural one. Radiation isn't an unsolvable problem, but it's one of the hardest. Shielding strong enough to protect astronauts could also make the spacecraft too heavy. So the real challenge is finding the right balance. Now, staying strong, sane, and protected is critical. But let's talk about another survival essential, one we can't live more than a few weeks without, food. On the International Space Station, 
meals are shipped up regularly. But for Mars missions, resupply isn't an option. Astronauts will need food that can last years and still taste edible. Because, let's face it, if your crew hates the menu, morale will tank faster than the food supply. Current space food includes freeze-dried fruits, rehydratable pasta, and special tortillas that don't make crumbs. But for a Mars mission, astronauts will need fresh food too. Even right now, the prepackaged food that goes to the ISS, they're still getting fresh fruits and vegetables. And we get resupply every couple of months. The shelf life of, of the packaged food is not long enough for a Mars mission. So the number one thing that we need to figure out before we send anybody to Mars, I would put this above radiation protection, above mental health, above medical capabilities, is the food. If you can't keep people healthy, I certainly wouldn't want somebody to get scurvy because even vitamin C becomes labile over a period of time, a long shelf life. And so being able to produce fresh uh, vitamins and nutrients, especially those that are not shelf stable, is absolutely essential. That's why NASA and other agencies are experimenting with growing plants in space. In 2015, astronaut Scott Kelly made history by eating the first ever space-grown lettuce aboard the ISS. It was a small bite, but a giant leap for astronaut cuisine. Space farming isn't just about nutrition, it's also psychological. Caring for plants gives astronauts a living connection to Earth, a reminder of home. Future missions may include greenhouses that grow vegetables, algae for protein, and even 3D printed meals using nutrient cartridges. Closed loop life support systems, the kind that recycle air, water, and waste, could also recycle nutrients into food production. Think of it as a miniature Earth ecosystem inside a spacecraft. So between exercise, shielding, medicine, mental health strategies and space farming, we're building a toolkit for survival. When it comes to deep space travel, technology isn't just helpful. It's the difference between life and death. And some of the ideas engineers are working on look straight out of science fiction. Let's start with life support. On the ISS, air and water are recycled. Sweat, breath, even urine, all turned back into clean drinking water. One of the good things about the ISS is that we can test, field test, the technologies we need to get to Mars and waste and regeneration are, are critical in those. Right now, we recycle 98 to 99% of our urine and sweat into potable drinking water. So when you think about that, that's, that's a huge amount of water that you don't have to launch into space. You can reclaim it, you can recycle it and reuse it, and we do. We crack it into potable water and technical water, and then we also crack it into oxygen and hydrogen. We breathe the oxygen, we throw the hydrogen overboard, and we turn yesterday's coffee into tomorrow's coffee. And in a way, when you're so critically dependent on launch mass, knowing where your next drink is coming from is, is pretty important, even if it's coming from you. Solid waste, uh, we're not quite that advanced yet. All the solid waste gets compacted into a, a canisters, which are sealed and then go into our returning cargo vehicles, which follow destructive re-entries into the atmosphere. So they burn up. We burn that along with other trash. For Mars missions, these systems will need to be nearly 100% efficient. Nothing can go to waste. Then there's artificial gravity. Long duration microgravity wreaks havoc on the body. One solution is a rotating spacecraft that spins to create centrifugal force, mimicking gravity. Think of it as a giant bicycle wheel in space, with the crew living on the rim. It's a concept engineers have toyed with since the 1960s, and while it hasn't flown yet, new mission designs are dusting off the idea. But while technology is vital, we don't need to imagine all of this in the abstract. We've already been running experiments right here on Earth. Space travel may seem unique, but humanity has actually been practicing for it in some of the harshest places on Earth. The ISS has been orbiting since 2000, serving as a giant laboratory for survival in microgravity. Every bit of knowledge we've gained, from exercise routines to water recycling, comes from this orbiting test bed. But there are also earthly environments that mirror life on a Mars mission. Take Antarctic research stations. For months at a time, crews are cut off from the outside world. No resupply, no sunlight in the winter, just the same team in a frozen desert. The psychological lessons learned here are crucial for planning Mars missions. 
group dynamics, leadership, and coping with isolation. In fact, NASA regularly sends teams to the Antarctic and undersea labs like NEMO, where astronauts live in underwater habitats to simulate space conditions. Submarines are another potent analog, small crews, limited supplies, and zero outside rescue for months at a time. Extreme isolation is, is this is why we are so interested in the Antarctic model because that is a similar extreme hazardous environment that has circadian misalignment, it has lack of stimulus, right? It's very much monotonous environment. It's a closed, confined environment. You can't go outside and smell rain and smell the earth. There has no smells, in fact. It's really quite an austere environment. And there are people who do not do well in confined environments, and so I think you have to pre-screen people. I don't, th I don't think that everybody is of the mental composure, if you will, or the, or the makeup. Some people do better than others in situations like that. In fact, Don Pettit, I had asked him this question one time, how would you prepare for a mission to Mars? And he said, I would sit in a cardboard box for a long time. So we've seen what's possible today, but what about tomorrow? What radical ideas could redefine human survival in deep space? Future survival may require future biology. Scientists are already exploring biomedicine and even genetic engineering to help humans cope with radiation and microgravity. There's even um, a group in uh, MIT uh, that has developed a small pill that you can ingest and will sit in your stomach and slowly elute out bacteria that will produce actually certain medications. So you can even genetically engineer the bacteria to make a medication that you want, say it's a radiation protectant. And now you don't have to bring a whole uh, pharmacy of those radiation protectants and all those pills. Another radical concept is cryosleep, slowing human metabolism so astronauts essentially hibernate during long missions. NASA has actually funded research into torpor-inducing technologies using cooling methods to put the body into a suspended state. It could reduce food, oxygen and psychological stress while making deep space travel more practical. Then there's nanomedicine, tiny robots inside the bloodstream that could repair damage, fight infections, or even monitor astronaut health in real time. It may sound far-fetched now, but remember, so did smartphones just a few decades ago. While most scientists and engineers are trying to solve the health concerns associated with being in space for extended periods of time, there is another option, speed. The biggest step is not a medical step. It is a technical step. I want to fly fast. You know, if you give me advanced propulsion and I can get there, say, in two or three months, well, think about all my problems with bone and muscle and psychological effects and food and radiation exposure. So much of that is, is immediately solved if we can fly faster. And advanced technologies like nuclear thermal or in particular, we'd really love to see plasma engines that are throttleable, uh, which could eventually give you abort scenarios. So we want to go there with the idea of a sustaining effort. And to do that, we really need an advanced propulsion. We want to fly faster. A few ideas for advanced propulsion have been tested over the years, with the most prominent probably being Project Orion of the 1950s, not to be confused with Lockheed Martin and NASA's recent Orion spacecraft. Project Orion suggested the idea of dropping nuclear pellets behind the craft, which would explode in a targeted manner. The pressure wave would effectively then push on the ship, accelerating it to astounding speeds while decreasing fuel volume by a huge margin. The project showed promise, but was eventually shelved due largely to a building range of concerns and regulations over the use of nuclear explosives in this manner. At the end of the day, space survival isn't just about Mars. Every challenge we solve for astronauts, recycling air and water, producing food in closed loops, coping with isolation, teaches us lessons for life here on Earth. Space farming could revolutionize food production on a warming planet. Closed loop recycling could change how we manage water in drought-stricken regions. Mental health strategies for astronauts could help people coping with extreme isolation on Earth. While billionaires like Elon Musk have dreams of terraforming Mars as a backup option should anything happen to Earth, the lessons we are learning trying to get there may provide us with the solutions to live better 
and protect the only home we've ever known.